All of our videos here are brought to you by the Landscape Certified Contractors Association. Due with the membership support, we're able to bring these videos to you each and every week. If you'd like to be part of our organization and help us bring these videos to you, make sure you visit www.irrigatortech.com and have a great day. So this is the part that I really like because I get to say my own name because I love the sound of it. My name is Merwin Wild. I'm a uh, state licensed contractor. I have a C27, which is landscape um, installation. I have a uh, D49, which is tree service. I'm an ISA certified arborist. I'm also a TCIA um, TCSP, which is a tree care safety professional. And that brings me to something that all of you have been saying, um, mentioning some of these training programs that we're taking tests for. Certified tree worker maybe, or certified arborist, or, and the, the training that we're gonna be doing today is based in safety, but it's not based in what my ideas are. Everything's gonna come out of the ISA standard right here, okay? This is the Z, I always get this part wrong. The Z133, okay? This is the arboriculture standard for, for, uh, for safety, okay? This is basically all the standards that we're gonna follow. <coughs> ISA will put on uh, certifications for tree care professionals. They'll put on uh, testing <laughs> for um, certified arborists, uh, utility specialist, uh, municipal arborist, and ISA uh, is one of our training um, standards. Um, they, they all work together. Um, TCIA is, uh, is also a source of training, and uh, they put out one, one of their trainings is EHAP, Electrical Hazard Awareness Program. We're gonna be touching on this today. This is a very specific training, but it's something that applies to all of us, and it's a, a, a big danger. One of the reasons why we, uh, we do training is because of safety. And I just want you guys to know that the work that we do in landscape and tree work is extremely dangerous work. Anybody ever seen that program, Thousand Ways to Die? <laughs> it's kind of a funny program, but in our industry, it's real. And just to give you a little bit of statistics, last year, the number one um, industry in the United States with the highest fatality rate was commercial logging. Now, none of us are commercial loggers in this room, but just to give you an idea, all the stored energy and dynamics of a tree, of all the industries in the United States, trees were killing the most people. Number two last year was the line clearance industry, which is what our company is mostly involved in. About 85, maybe 90% of our contracts are with utility companies, Southern California Edison, um, APS in Arizona, PG&E up north, and what our business is is that we trim the right-of-ways for live conductors throughout California and Arizona. Um, our company is about 350 employees right now, I think at last count, and uh, that's a lot of guys spread out over a lot of area. The line clearance industry, and not our company, and this is not anything, of course, to be proud of, but was number two in the highest fatality rate and recordable disabling injuries in the United States last year. We always compete, or not compete, or have that distinguishing part of our, uh, our industry. Uh, another one is fisheries. Anybody that gets on a boat, we've all seen the program Deadliest Catch, anybody that gets on a boat and goes out and gets something out of the ocean, they're usually up there with us, and they're usually one or two last year, don't know, but there are jobs that are inherently and specifically dangerous. And no matter how much safety you put on it, the job needs to be done, and we are dealing in that, in that arena. Anybody that has anything to do with trees, we were number one and number two last year. Um, we're gonna be addressing some of the equipment. All of our equipment is dangerous. Uh, OSHA will tell you that falls are one of the highest rate injuries that they'll have. We're always in trees. We're always in a bucket. We're, you know, 
felling trees. The, the list goes on and on. We deal with chainsaws, which is one of the most dangerous tools bar none. And so what we're gonna touch on today, or this specific training right now, is chipper operation. Anybody ever use a chip chipper? Just give me a quick show of hands. Anybody been around a chipper, use a chipper, put something in a chipper? Okay, Francisco and I attended a um, TCIA training last November, and um, we got some statistics. And one of the statistics was that nine men lost their lives last year in chippers. That's a very dangerous piece of equipment, and it's completely avoidable having an accident. Six of those accidents or fatalities weren't even witnessed because we have two man crews out there largely. Okay, so the guy's in the tree, you got your groundsman, he's you know controlling the job site, hauling brush back to the chipper. Didn't even see what happened. Three of those were witnessed because the crews were larger or there were other crews or witnesses available. And one of the take homes for today, and I, that's what I, you know, because we can talk and talk and talk and watch videos and you guys are gonna take home this much. That's just education, okay? So I'm gonna drill on the take homes and I'm gonna be asking you what the take homes are. Okay, this is one of the take homes. Never, ever, ever stand on the shoot table of a chipper. What's one of the take homes? Okay, the table is, and we're going to go down and inspect our chipper. My boss was nice enough to roll out the, 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 the dog and pony show. We have wonderful equipment, and so we have a new chipper downstairs and a brand new lift truck, and we're going to go over some of that stuff. But basically what happened to these three gentlemen that were witnessed was they were standing on the chipper and pushing debris in to the chipper. Okay? There's other ways to get involved in injuries in the chipper, and one of the common ways is, is that as you're looking at the table, here's the chute, there's the truck, and I'm feeding the material in directly behind it. Okay? One of the take-homes for chipper safety is never feed from the rear. What's one of the take-homes? Never, never feed from the rear. Okay. Because you're lined up with the business end of that chipper. Okay? There's three different kinds of chippers. Probably the most common one is the most dangerous one because it's evolved. <coughs> they call it the chuck and duck, but basically it's a drum chipper. Okay, that's the one that has the high pitched sound and when you throw stuff in there. The thing is, is when you throw stuff in there, you gotta like, cause here come all the little branches and they're gonna whip you. So you just chuck it and you run, right? Okay, so that's probably the most common one that's still in use. That type of chipper is being phased out. In fact, I'm not even sure that any manufacturers even make that type anymore. But there's a, mechan there's a disc chipper now, um, and it has a mechanical feed to it, okay? And there's more safety features on chippers, and then there's a third kind that's kind of a hybrid that is a drum chipper that has mechanical hydraulic feeds into it. We've got more safety bars, we've got little push bars down at the, at the table, Accidents, if you can identify it, one thing in safety that's, that's always been clear, if you can identify it, you can prevent it. So we're gonna identify hazards with this machinery that we use. And then we're gonna avoid accidents because a chipper is certainly a useful tool. Anybody that's worked with them and had to haul off trees or brush or load stuff, you know that a chipper is just, wow, this cuts your day in half, the fatigue, everything, that goes with it. It's a great tool, but at the same time, it's extremely dangerous. We're gonna watch a little bit of video. We're going to uh, go down to the truck. We're gonna take a look over there. We're gonna take a quick break. There's a couple other topics that I wanna go over today, just to give you a quick overview of what we're gonna be doing. Um, we did the intro, we did the ANSI. Um, if you needed a reference, and you wanna be in the tree, and the grounds industry and the, and the green industry, this is gonna be your Bible, okay? Um, there's one for landscape, there's, this one is specific for arboriculture, but basically in this room, we're in the green industry. Everything that has to do with the lawn, landscape, and uh, your other resources is gonna be ISA. Several mentioned that they're studying for exams, okay? That's good, training is important. TCIA is another great resource. 
Um, we're going to be talking about the chipper. We're going to be doing a little bit of this electrical <laughs> hazard awareness program. It's another thing that is very, uh, very dangerous to us. And then we're going to be doing a little bit of climbing, climbing safety. Um, we're going to get to the video right now. Any questions so far? One thing that's important about training is that we interact. In any program when we get training, if you buy in and you ask me one question, the likelihood that you are going to get this training and that you are not going to be injured and you, and you will have a successful career and provide for your family is greatly increased. There are no silly questions. Somebody else is probably thinking the same thing. Okay. So as you guys buy in, I want to give you permission to tell a story, to, you know, we need to keep it brief because we're going to jam it in here and I talk, I'm going to talk fast and we're going to cover a lot of ground because we're just doing a little overview on these things, okay, on these topics. But I need you guys to buy in and ask some questions. So we got any questions so far? Yeah, the um, book gets you show right now, we get those online or would you pass them? Yeah, you can there? order them online. Um, not, you guys probably have these ANSI uh, standard, but it's uh, the American National Standard Institute, uh, ANSI, A-N-C-I, and they'll have, for every industry, and they're not a government agency, they're independent, but this is what their business is, and normally OSHA gets all of their standards developed from ANSI. Um, OSHA or Cal OSHA will expand on on these regulations and make them more specific as situations prop up. But uh, this is a very important book, okay? And specific, you know, there's one for landscape, there's one for uh, groundskeeping and, uh, and so on. So you wanna get to the ANSI standards and find the one for your specific industry. This one's for all arbor culture and that's what we're covering today. Anybody else got a question? They're about like 15 bucks. How often should Safety we hold a safety meeting every day, okay, and we hold a group safety meeting um, once a week. Um, each, job, each job that we pull up to will have a job briefing, which is a small safety meeting for the crew. We go over job plan, we create a job plan, we do our safety plan, we assign work, if it's the same work all day, OSHA will, this is a standard of OSHA. If it's similar work all day long, you set up a job plan in the morning and then after lunch. But if the situation changes to a great extent, it's a job plan for each tree. In other words, if I'm trimming a row of trees and they're all pretty similar, we set up a job plan in the morning and then we go over another job briefing after lunch, okay? But if I'm doing an oak here and I'm doing a eucalyptus over there, and you know, then it's then it's each tree. And job briefing is something we're going to be going over during the climbing. But you know, job briefing and job plan. Most of the time, when investigators go out and invest a, investigate a um, a, uh, a fatality or a disabling injury, no job plan. Start asking the other guys, well, what was the plan? And it's important. And for our industry, it's, uh, it's regulation of, uh, that we have to document it. We have to have guys sign it, okay? Um, you know, depending on what level of uh, your industry is at, uh, we'll have to check OSHA and see if that's actually a requirement, but certainly a good idea. The more we talk and communicate, um, the safer we're gonna be. So let's get to the uh, first video here. <laughs> Safety during maintenance. Let's get going. 
so that we can close the pickle hitch, insert the locking pin, and we're secure. Now we just need to pull the bottom pin. Now Bob will connect the chains. He crosses them underneath the tongue, making sure he leaves enough slack so that it won't bind when we turn the truck. Connects the electrical hookup. And while he's doing that, I check the discharge chute. Some chippers, you have to reverse the discharge chute for towing, while others you can just leave pointed right into the back of the truck. Now, we've already checked the tire pressure in the treads. I'll pull the chocks, and we'll check the lights, and we'll be ready to go. <coughs> Once we arrive at the job site, we need to give a little bit of thought to how we position the truck and chipper. We don't want to park directly under any of the trees that we're going to be working on because that would be a safety hazard. If we're parked alongside the street, we need to make sure we put out the cones and the warning signs. It's important to try to keep traffic and pedestrians out of the work area. We also want to allow sufficient space behind the in-feed chute so that we can stack and chip the brush safely without tripping over anything. Now, if we're going to be chipping brush with the chipper still attached to the truck, it's important to engage the parking brake on the truck and chop the wheels. We have a final quick check to make before we start up the chipper. We want to make sure the chipping area is free of personnel. We want to check the in-feed chute to make sure it's free of debris that may kick back when we start the chipper. We want to make sure that all safety devices are firmly in place before we start it. We want to make sure that the clutch is disengaged. And we want to make sure that the discharge chute is pointed in a safe and proper direction. The brush needs to be stacked in a way that makes it easy and convenient for the chipper operator to feed the chipper. Usually what that means is placing the butt ends of the brush closest to the in-feed chute. We don't want to place it so close, however, that it would create a trip hazard immediately behind that in-feed chute area. When feeding material into a rotary drum chipper, feed and turn away in one continuous motion. When feeding small material, throw material into the blades. In both cases, let go of the brush before your hands get any closer to the blades than the back of the in-feed hopper and before the brush hits the chipping blades. You can push small material against the blades with a long limb or you can lay material on the feed table and shove a long piece of brush in after it. Never reach into the in-feed hopper with any part of your body for any reason. Again, the mechanical in-feed chippers, Always larger the size to push or carry smaller pieces through the in-feed. Smaller pieces will partially open the feed wheels, making it easier for the feed wheels to allow the larger diameter pieces to feed. The easiest way to feed a large diameter piece is to leave about a foot and a half of the previous piece sticking out of the feed wheels. With the wheels partially separated, they can easily climb over the larger piece. You'll be tempted, but don't reach past the back of the infeed. Larger pieces can be cut at a sharp angle to get them into the infeed rollers. Larger diameter wood may cause the engine to lug. You don't want the engine to slow down to the point that it will stall or plug the chipper. On hydraulically fed chippers, when you hear the engine slowing down, push the control bar to the neutral position to stop the feed wheels. When the engine regains full RPM, pull the control bar and resume chipping. Some machines with a feed sensor or auto feed system do this automatically. Material too large for the chipper opening must be cut to the capacity of the chipper. Keep a chainsaw handy when chipping large diameter or limbing material. Should the material become jammed in the feed system, Reverse the feed wheels to dislodge it.
stay out of the chip discharge area when the chipper is running and the cutter wheel is turning, even if brush is not being fed into the chipper. Chips discharged at high velocity can cause serious injury. Never feed material containing rocks, wire, or foreign debris into the chipper. Anything other than brush will not only dull chipper knives, but may cause knives to break and could damage the disc or drum, bearings or anvil, or cause projectiles to be thrown from the machine. Remember that chipping brush can be hazardous. You can avoid the hazards associated with these powerful chippers and their operation by following a few simple safety rules. We've talked a lot about safety during operation, but a lot of accidents happen during maintenance. Bob's going to assist me as we go through a maintenance checklist. The first thing that we want to do before we perform any maintenance on this machine, generally speaking, is turn off the ignition and remove the keys. Then we want to wait until all rotating parts have come to a complete stop. Oftentimes we can check that by looking at the end of the bearing on a disc such as this machine or the belt movement on another type of machine. Once we're confident that everything is stopped, it's safe to get in here and perform at least an inspection. So we're going to remove this hood lock pin and open up the hood gently. Why we have this hood open? It's a good thing to notice and check for any excessive play or wear in the actual hood hinge. Some accidents have occurred because the hood, having been damaged, has come into contact with a rotating disc. Of course, this hood should never be open when the disc is rotating. Now we want to get this disc lock pin installed so we can safely inspect this disc without any chance of its rotating. Okay, we're locked in. Types of things we're looking for in here would include wear on the knives, any bad chips or leading edge dull. Another thing on this machine that we'd want to look for is any deformation, any bending or cracking in the paddles or fans here. Looks pretty good. Another thing we should check on most machines is something called the anvil or bed knife. In this machine, it happens to be way down in the bottom here, and this is not the way that we would access it. A worn anvil or bed knife also can cause very poor chipper performance. Okay, you want to pull that pin, and we'll get this cover back down. You notice that Bob and I are both wearing gloves. We never get into a machine like this into the the knives without gloves on. <laughs> Another thing you want to do um, in the course of operating your machine is just observe how it operates. Listen for funny noises, poor performance. Of course, a poorly performing machine should be shut down and should be checked by a qualified mechanic before it's operated. By reviewing this video in workbook chapter 5, you should understand the operational differences between the three main types of chipper. Remember the basic points for chipper preventive maintenance and pre-trip inspection, how to attach a chipper for towing and how to set up for chipping, know what personal protective equipment is needed for operating the brush chipper, understand the safest and most efficient way to cut, drag, and stack brush, and understand the safest and most efficient way to start and operate a chipper with a mechanical end feed as well as the typical drone chipper. This video should have given you respect and appreciation for the chipper you'll be using. On behalf of the ISA and the NAA, please work safely. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. So why didn't long sleeves mention it at all? Well, they did mention about clothing. And I'm going to touch on clothing because one of the things is, is a lot of times when you have a truck and a chipper, you're going to be parked on a thoroughfare. And here is where OSHA regulations will come in conflict with what's practical. Okay? Chipper operation will say don't wear loose-fitting cl clothing. But OSHA says that if you're within 25 feet of a thoroughfare, which is defined as anything that a car travels on, a driveway, a dirt road, your truck is sitting on a thoroughfare, 
It could be a street, a highway, that you have to have visible clothing. I think it's a class two right now, okay? And that's loose fitting clothing. Now in our industry of tree work, we have to use a five point tear away vest, which is basically covered with Velcro. So if this vest that's somewhat loose fitting gets caught by a branch, and a lot of investigations have shown that people get pulled into chippers because they'll have a long sleeve shirt or their shirt wasn't tucked in. Or you can get pulled in with a bracelet that said, mention jewelry. <clears throat> and this is why the piece of material with just a little bit of thought, you know, we're cutting the trees, it's getting late, we've got to clean this up, we don't want to come back to the job site again, but I'm going to put this big piece in there that has a lot of other small branches hanging off of it. All those other small branches are coming by and they're going to want to grab me. Okay. That is why we feed from the side and step away. Now, some of the newer ones that have the mechanical feed, it's not like this crazy boom, you know, that, that happens that fast. But still, if you get, you know, a jacket or something and it hooks into your pocket, you're not going to be able to pull away from it. The newer the chipper, there's more safety features and so on and so forth. The idea is this. That's why they say don't use cuffed gloves because the cuffed glove will protect, you know, your skin up there, but it's loose. Okay, this is a cuff that's tight, but have you guys all seen the other kind of work glove that has like this big kind of like cuff on it? They always mention that um, because it gets caught. So you have to be aware of the, the clothing you're wearing and keep it, okay, so say we're chipping on a, a cold day. Say it started to rain or it's snowing, which we, you know, we work up in the mountains. You got a jacket on, okay? You just need to be aware of that. So when you're looking at the piece that you're going to put in, should we call the guy over with the chainsaw and the, and the saw chaps? Because remember, saw chaps are required that whenever you're using a chainsaw on the ground, you have to have saw chaps. And that regulation is going to be extended to everybody that's aloft, probably within the next four or five years. OSHA's get gearing up to say, hey, everybody that's trimming in the tree has to have saw chaps, but they're more pants. You know, they're developing pants to... Uh, to wear up in the, uh, in the tree. <clears throat> Bring the guy over with the chainsaw, cut it up a little bit more. Limit out a little bit, okay? Make a little more smaller piece, some brush, so that when it goes in. You know, when they were doing the examples, somebody had already taken all the brush off of those big branches. <laughs> well, guess what? Not Frank and I will go out on the job site, and these guys are putting horrendous, I mean, it's like sticking out like a caterpillar, like this, <laughs> stuffing it into the chipper. Okay, yeah, you can do that if you have enough experience. If you know that it's a pine tree and it's not, doesn't have a lot of hooks on it and it's going in base first, okay? But if you do that with an oak and it's got a little craggly arm that's going out like that, see, here's what we're talking about in safety, that you're responsible for your own safety and you don't know more than what your experience is. Every tree is different. Every situation is different. My training is different. That's why the balance between training and knowledge, what we learn in here, is balanced with what is the reality on, jo on the job training. And we all know that the majority of our training is on the job and experience, right? I'm not gonna do that again. I made a mess. I made another hour's work for myself, right? Or I hurt myself. Won't do that again. I raised my hand. We need to be able to tell on ourselves, okay? The reason I'm telling on myself is because it was the first year that I was in landscape and I was cleaning up a job and I took my hand off of the chainsaw. When we're operating the chainsaw, guess what? It has two handles on it. You know why? One for each hand. Thank you. Because it's a regulation, OSHA, that you have two hands on the chainsaw. Guess what the guys want to do up in the tree? I want to one hand the chainsaw, right? So what did I do? I'm cutting some brush in front of me, right? I let go, I take my hand off, I gotta move some, some brush. It's idling down, I didn't put the brake on. I pull some brush out, it gets caught on something, and there's the scar right there. Just, just nicked it. Okay, but that's a chainsaw accident. That could have been my whole freaking finger. Okay, we need to be able to have enough humility to tell on ourselves and say, this is the near miss. Because if you do it, you may save the other five guys on your crew from having to do it. 
Okay? Secrets and safety are no good. Secrets means that we're not, that we don't care about the people that we're working with or we don't care about our industry. I'm the risk safety manager of my, and you know, and I make mistakes. I made a mistake. Okay? I think it's easy for me to raise my hand in front of all you guys and say, I had a chainsaw accident. Why? Because I didn't know. I didn't have the experience. Somehow we make it through. We're going to watch another quick video right now and then we're going to go downstairs. What's the schedule like for? Whatever you're doing. Okay. <laughs> because everyone knows the most important thing about any training is the food, right? Um, yeah. Uh, lunch, lunch will be here in about uh, 15 minutes and then we'll, uh, after, we come, yeah, after we come back upstairs, we'll have lunch briefly and we can still have Merwin talk about it while we eat if you like. And by the way, I don't normally dress like this, but the reason I wear a tie and a shirt when I come train you guys is because I want you to know that this means something to me because it really is all of our lives. Normally, the well-dressed arborist wears a safety vest from the minute he leaves his house to the minute he comes back because I rode a guy a warning once, a big guy, bigger than me. And then one day he saw me without my training vest. <laughs> so I wear it from the time I leave the house till I come back. And I always have my hard hat, and I always have my whistle, and in tree care, a chin strap is always very important, okay? So this is the guy that I look like normally in some jeans and a, and a Mowbray shirt, okay? I put this tie on so that you guys would know that this means something, okay? That this is important. This is your lives, this is the future of your family, and you guys, for whatever reason, chose or however that happened, to be in an industry that you can successfully have a great career, but it can also kill you. So we're gonna watch another video and then we're gonna head downstairs and we're gonna look at the chip. Any questions?